Hello and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I'm Danny Simmons. And I'm Kurt Norbert. And today we are looking at a very interesting topic. Proverbs 11 and verse 1 says, Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Our topic today is deceit. Uh, deceit, what does it mean? Well, uh, how does it work? How do I identify it either in someone else or in myself? Uh, deceit is simply uh, a way to cause others to accept what is false uh, as though it were true. It's an attempt or a device that can be used to deceive. And we saw that in Proverbs 11 and verse 1, dishonest scales or an abomination to the Lord. It's basically when you've set aside, intentionally set aside truth in your own integrity and you've used deception to take advantage of others all while appearing to be doing everything above board. That's, it's intentional. Um, and and, again, and I, I said that on purpose. We're setting the truth aside. We're setting justice aside and even our own integrity in order to deceive so that we might gain something. Uh, Today, we're going to try to discuss the tools of deceit that are used or mentioned in the Bible. I've given you one, Proverbs 11 and verse 1. But in Leviticus 19, beginning in verse 25, God says to his people, You shall do no injustice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, or volume. You shall have honest scales, honest weights, an honest ephah, and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 14. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who have behaved unrighteously, are an abomination to the Lord your God. So God, who's just and perfect, makes it crystal clear. If you bring in faulty weights that don't equal what they say they equal, and you do that to take advantage of your brother, that you're an abomination to God. And there's a, a principle being taught here. We read these passages that you just mentioned, and he asked the question, is God really concerned about weights and measures? Well, yes, but there's something more going on here. He's concerned about a condition of the heart, an honest heart, a just heart, a heart that is fair uh, with its fellow man. So that's what he's driving at. And I think it it's illustrative to look at the basic definition, uh, the Greek word for deceit or guile is a synonym that's used throughout the Bible. They're, they're almost exactly the same thing. But uh, the, the Greek word refers to bait. You put something on the end of a hook or a, 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 a trap under some leaves or, or a mouse trap, you know, in your garage or whatever, and you bait it with something that's going to attract whatever it is that you're after. So you are, you're tricking that prey into thinking that, oh, here's something good for me when they're probably going to meet up with death if they pursue that. Mm. And that's what deceit is. It's trickery with the intent to harm or to gain advantage. Uh, and so the Bible has a lot to say about this because once that door is open to deceit, even if there's just some little, you know, I'm going to do this this time to get, get by on this. Right. Now you've opened the door, and it doesn't take long for that to just mushroom and spiral, spiral out of control. Um, I think of, uh, of Abraham when he uh, went into uh, the country that Abimelech was king of and, and basically lied about his relationship with Sarah. Um, he said, uh, she's my sister. Well, he points out later after being exposed and rebuked by Abimelech that she is my sister. You know, I, I wasn't telling a whole lie. Well, even then, it, it's only a, a half half truth because she's his half sister. <laughs> but the idea was is to get them to think she was not his wife. Right. And it put Abimelech's kingdom in danger. God closed up the wombs of his wife and concubines, and uh, Abimelech rightly uh, 
rebuked him in Genesis 20, verse 9. It's a, here's a good description of the response to deceit. Abimelech says, what have you done to us? How have I offended that you offended you that you've brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. So deceit's a dangerous and destructive thing. Uh, when, you're, when you're baiting your hook to try to trick somebody, that's the kind of deceit that God sees as an abomination to him. I think it's important to understand that's how he describes it. A couple times he says it is an abomination to God. Yeah, that's right. And it's not because uh, your, your weight is a half of an ounce too light there. It's because you're being dishonest. It's a condition of the heart and you know that it. will destroy you and people around you. Yeah. I like the Abraham example because, you know, when they're coming into Egypt, he's coaching Sarah. And it's just it's yeah. interesting to watch him talk to her. And he says, look, you're beautiful. That's a good start. But after that, everything else he says is horrible. He says, they're going to kill me uh, if they find out you're my wife. So tell them you're my sister. Well, what, is that, what kind of situation does that put her in? Yeah. And She's free now all of a sudden, according to yeah. the land of Egypt and, and Abimelech and his household. That's insane, and I'm, uh, you're right. Abimelech said just the right thing. Why did you do this to us? Mm-hmm. You you set us up to do evil. Yeah, it would have been unbeknownst to us, but it still would have been evil. He recognizes that it would have been wrong to do that. So, the great wisdom coming from Abimelech, and now he's you know he's rebuking the man of God. God tells Abimelech he's a my prophet. Yeah, he's a fearful prophet and he's a fibbing prophet, but he is my prophet because he tells him Abraham will pray for you. Mm-hmm. And your household will be healed. So you know, all that is very interesting. What's happening there? But Abraham made a terrible mistake uh, in doing that and put his life, yeah. his wife, he in put danger. Sarah at risk. And, and like I mentioned, he put Abimelech and his kingdom at risk. It it just was. It was an abomination. Yeah, God exactly. had to step in and correct it. That's right. In fact, in that story, he appeared uh, in a dream or, or spoke to Abimelech by night. I can't remember exactly how he revealed himself, but. He basically laid it out, here's what's happening. And Abimelech rightly protested, in the innocence and integrity of my heart, I did this. He said, this is not my wife, she's my sister. And God was merciful. He said, I know you did it in the integrity of your heart. Yeah. And that's why I've spared you, but you need to make it right. Yeah, that's and right. And so he did. He went to Abraham and rebuked him and gave him his wife back and, and uh, got everything straight, gave him wherever he wanted to go live in the land. But that could have had disastrous consequences if God had not stepped into that. Absolutely. And what we want to do is, as we talk about this today is we think about the word deceit. I, I believe, I, I'm just sure that everyone, everyone who ever hears this podcast uh, has either deceived or been deceived at some point in their life. And they know what it looks like. They know how it works and how it feels when it's done to them. And so we understand God's word and, and the reason that he does these things for us to, you know, just make sure the scales are honest, make sure that what you do is above board, make sure that it's right. And it's agreed upon by every party that the, you know, the, the measuring stick used to come to a conclusion was just, it's accurate. Uh, you can depend on it because then what happens next is fair. And so we, we have to ask ourselves, am I involved in deceit today, right now? Am, is there something I'm doing in my marriage, at work, with my kids, you know, it, it really is something that can be a self-examining tool. It's not just a matter of us saying, here's what the Bible says about deceit. It's more um, God says it's an abomination to him, and it's, that is not where we want to be ever. So if there's something going on, there is a right way to, to move forward, even if I'm involved in something like that. I can just come clean and say I'm not doing this anymore. Isn't that right? Yeah, Uh you know, we if we stop and think, like you said, you can you can think of how you have been deceived or perhaps deceived. You've sinned or you've seen uh, different examples of it probably in your life. The guy that cheats the time clock at work. Mm. Uh, when I was a kid, I was a horrible high school student because I hated doing my homework, and I would try to trick my parents into thinking I'd done it. Um, of course, then when report card time comes along and why did you get a D? Well, you know, then you've got some explaining to do. Yes. Uh, but, but there it is in every aspect of life, as you mentioned, marriages, households, employer relationships, uh, 
a group of friends where one guy tries to put stuff over on everyone else to get his way, deceit is just rampant in the world because without God, we're inherently selfish. It's me first, and I'm going to lie to people. I'm going to trick them. I'm going to engage in dishonest behavior to, to better me and get my way. Yeah, I want it now, and I don't want to work too hard to get it. So deceit mm. is just a great tool to, to accomplish everything that you want, and it's sinful. Um, Proverbs 11 and verse 18, it says, The wicked man does deceptive work, but he who sows righteousness will have a sure reward. It's, it's right there. The, the deceptive man, uh, the wicked man is deceptive in, in his work. And it reminds me of a, a Bible class I was involved in several years ago where you know one of the mothers that was in the class said, you know, one, one of my kids, uh, he works double hard to make it look like he did the work that we told him to do. <laughs> and I've always, it's always stuck out in my mind that, because that can happen, you know, where a kid, he actually takes pride in making people think that he did what he was supposed to do, but he knows he didn't. And so there's like this little feeling of joy, I guess, or, or success. I don't know what it is, but, you know, she finally had to sit him down and said, look, let me just show this to you. You worked extra hard to make it look like you had done the one thing that really wasn't that hard to do. You see, you're working harder to make it look like you did what you should have done and how silly that is, you know? And it's hard to get a kid to come to terms with that and go, okay, you're right, that, that's not, that didn't make any sense. Uh, but it does happen. Oh yeah, a kids, kids will test the water all the time. They, they learn very quickly that they, if they can pull off something deceitful, they're going to get their way. Yeah. But it's, it's eventually going to catch up. And uh, like I said, with me and my lack of uh, doing my homework, it caught up. Um, made things real unpleasant for a while. <laughs> but that's what happens. We're, we think short term and we think selfishly. And so if I do this, I can get by with this right now. They won't catch me that I made this mistake or I did this or I can advance myself this way. We don't look long term to see what might that cause. Like the example you just mentioned, finally the parent just had to sit him down and say, you know, we know you're doing this. <laughs> Obviously she was aware. Mm -hmm. And it's really dumb because you're not really gaining anything. <laughs> Why not just put that effort into doing what's right? Then you won't have to worry about covering up for yourself. Yeah. You'll feel better that you did what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Everyone around you that's aware of that will be pleased. Yeah, okay, cool. He went and did that. That's great. Instead of wasting all this effort to make yourself look like something you're not. That's right. And that to, there's the lesson. If, in, in that simple example, if the child does what was asked the way he was asked to do it, now there's peace of mind in, in him. There's nothing to hide. He did it. It's done. Right. It's right there. Yeah. I, you know, I... Instead, he's trying to disguise and cover up and make it look like it was done the way it was asked to be done. You know, like fold your clothes and he just crams them all underneath the bed or whatever. Mm. Um, and then you got to cover that up and then you know, you're, you're looking over your shoulder all the time. If it's done, then it's done. And, and, and even if parents say, well, I don't think you did do it, then he can explain step by step. No, this is what I did. Here's how I did it. Uh, and be sure of that. There's peace there and there's integrity there. Mm -hmm. And it can be defended. You know, it's better. And that, that's the lesson to me. It's, it is better to just say, I, I don't know why you're accusing me of this because this is what I've actually done just the way you asked me. And that can be explained. It can be shown. It can be laid out. There's, there's safety there, and there's peace there. And there's so much danger in deceiving somebody, and then it's uncovered. They become aware of it. Mm. Now, you don't deserve any trust from them. Your reputation is shattered by one little deed, and it may take years, if ever, if, if you first of all get the opportunity to correct that and then try to rebuild that trust. That, that seed of doubt that you planted through your deceit is always going to be there. Now, with time and, and your consistent demonstration of integrity and truth, then, then that can be healed. But it's not an easy task, and all you have to do is do it again, and you might as well forget it.
and and the danger also is that deceit can become a habit just like any sin yeah i got away with that 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 was really a positive so here's this other situation i'm just going to pull the same trick and i can slide by well you might do that for a while but it's going to come crashing down that's right and then no one will trust you because did you hear what that guy did there he is he did this and you know it's it's all over the place so who's going to ever believe you? Yeah. Who's going to ever have confidence in you? You are ruining your life when you when you go down this road. And there are some people who are habitually deceitful. Yeah, it has become a habit and that's the that's only way awful. they know uh, or will will use to get out of a tough situation or get something they want. Uh, deceit is is the fall the go-to position. It's your default. That's sad. It's embarrassing. So I'm going to read a verse for you, and then I want to, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Proverbs 16:11 says, "Honest weights and scales are the Lord's; all the weights in the bag are His work." Um, so the, I see I've read, read I don't know three or four different passages that talk about honest scales. Um, why does He keep repeating Himself? Well, obviously, it's a problem that's <laughs> that's got God's attention. He knows it's something we're extremely vulnerable to. Uh, we can do it without even half thinking about it 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 becomes be, because of the environment we're raised in in a sinful world it becomes a quick fix it's so easy to fall into it yeah uh, you know here i am the bread merchant and i'm just going to lighten my weight by a half a shekel or right. or make it heavier whatever's going to give the advantage to me and that way i can i can pick up an extra half a denarius every day or, you know, some whatever. Well, now you've tainted your character. And what's to keep you from expanding on that? Yeah, because you're getting away with it. Yeah, you're getting away with it. Hey, this is working great. But it's it's not going to forever. Uh, your sin will find you out, as the Scriptures tells us. So... And, and you're working in the marketplace, you, you're meeting people, and you, you have to appear to be an honest man uh-huh. who's worked through the night to bake the bread. You know, all, all those things still have to be intact. But you know that you're lying to everyone who comes to you, and they're like, hey, Joe, you know, how, how are things going? Ah, oh, great. How's you? you know? And you know in the back of your mind, I'm stealing from you. But you can't let that person know that. So, so deceit, again, I, you know, there's constant red flags for the person who is deceiving that they should be able to pick up on. And some people absolutely refuse to see that and are even get to the point where they're willing to fight over. I did not lie. I did not yeah. do it was wrong all the while knowing that they're they did just lying through their teeth. And that's look what deceit causes. You're stealing from somebody, whether it's time or money or an amount of something you're lying to cover it up. I mean, it just, it just goes berserk. I know. And that's maybe one reason why God was so concerned about it, these repetitive warnings, both in the Old and New Testament. That's right. Against practicing deceit. Yeah. And that's something that we always say, that if, if the Lord says it once, then that's all he has to do. Mm-hmm. It, it's as true and as sure as it's ever going to be if the Lord has said it once. If he says it twice, it speaks to a condition that we may have or potentially may need to deal with in our lives. And so he doesn't say it once or twice in Proverbs. I counted nine times. Proverbs yeah, 20. And just and, Proverbs. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. Proverbs 20 and verse 10. Diverse weights and diverse measures are both alike. They are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 20 and verse 23. Diverse weights are an abomination to the Lord and dishonest scales are not good. It's, you know, it's word for word the same thing. We're in the same chapter and, and God is saying through... Um, Solomon, Mm -hmm. this is not approved by me. Do not do this. Um, And again, it's not just God's hung up on commerce. He's concerned about character. And deceit is just such a terribly destructive thing to a person's character. That's right. God does not want us to go there. It tears down who you should be. Yeah, look at David and, and his disaster with Bathsheba what did he do instead of coming clean he tried to deceive Uriah in fact what just gets me 
constantly about that. He took advantage of Uriah's integrity. I know. And his honor to try to cover this up by deceiving him. Go go visit your house tonight. And that way you'll think the kid is yours. <laughs> and it just on and on. And then tries to deceive the whole nation, uh, covering everything up. It was a disaster. Part of his punishment for that was his house never knew peace after that. Yep. Because now David was morally compromised. It was more difficult for him to stand up against his evil sons and rebuke them for the things they did. Amnon and Absalom and on and on. And that, that was the punishment that was brought on. That's the consequence of his sin. He destroyed his house. And that's what can happen in a family. Once you've got someone in there who has striven to deceive and it's exposed. All of the disruption and the heartache and the distrust that that breeds in a situation like that. I've always loved what Peter said about Jesus when he said that he committed no sin, nor was deceit or guile found in his mouth. It's almost... It's enough to say he committed no sin. But why did Peter point that specific thing out? There was no deceit found in his mouth. He always spoke the truth. Yep. He never misled or misrepresented him to anybody. So we can trust him. His integrity is pristine. There's no reason for us to doubt what he says because he never tried to trick anyone. He never baited anybody. Uh, to me, that's such a beautiful picture. And, of course, the New Testament goes on and warns us over and over. Uh, the same chapter for, or in First Peter 3, I should say. Peter says, he, he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. So, you want to have a good life? <laughs> yeah. You want to have a peaceful life where people respect and trust you? Then refrain your tongue from evil. And then a specific point, your lips from speaking deceit. So God says a lot about it in his word because it's so dangerous. Yeah. And it's all right there. You want to live a good life, a healthy life. Um, don't be deceitful. It, it really is at all rest right there. Because you're, you're either found out to be a deceitful person or you're found out to be an honest person. And in, in both cases, you've, you've built up a character trait that people can depend on. And how sad is that if you're a liar that people know you're a liar? Yeah. I, I don't That's care what you say. the only thing I have confidence in you about yeah. is that you I, I know one thing. <laughs> you are not telling me the truth. Man. And that is such an awful thing. And as you said, it's so difficult to try to repair after it's out there it can be repaired there's repentance is always available but that turning around and trying to restore the trust that was once uh, in its proper place is so difficult and it's so hard on everyone um, there's no reason to go there you just be honest tell the truth and do what's right that would be at work um, in your marriage in every other situation where you're involved with other people um, have you, you go to the grocery store you go to H-E-B yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I Walmart does it too. I don't know why I'm focusing on HEB, but you ever done the self checkout? Mm hmm. So the scale? Yeah. For bananas and. Mm hmm. I hate that thing. <laughs> I'm just going to use this opportunity to just say that publicly. That thing is so sensitive. Mm. If you set something down on that, the whole thing's a scale, apparently. If you set something down on it, it's like, oh, you got to call, get ask for help. Yeah. You put yeah. something in the bag that doesn't belong there. It's like, no, I just, I, I was balancing myself and rested my hand. That, that thing drives me berserk. But the good part about that scale, though I dislike it as much as I do, is that now the challenge to me is to call the person over and say something went wrong and to be sure that I didn't just steal something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Something's wrong with this device because I haven't done anything wrong. So I, in that small sense, I like it that I can call the person over and say, hey, you, you have to check this out. Go through yeah. my stuff. Um, but but in, in that moment, we're going to find out whether the machine is right about me slipping something over onto the purchase side before I rang it up. Yeah, and that, that 
uh, I found out recently that that happens, that one reason the associate is there in that area is not only to help people with the machine, but they're trying to keep an eye on it. And when it's busy, I don't know how they can do it. But I had never considered it. But as you're ringing stuff up, it'd be real easy to just take that loaf of bread and drop it in your bag. Right. Uh, now, I guess since the bag is being weighed, it would f flash on that or something. But yeah, they often say, you know, put put this item in your cart. Or you might have a bag in your cart and you just drop an item in there. And you didn't have to pay for it. Right. Well, you've just deceived. And what did that deceive do? It, it enabled you to steal. Uh, you're lying that you paid for this when you didn't. You're shoplifting. Mm -hmm. So I thought, wow, I, I wonder how they're able to control that because it seems like it would be something that people would really take advantage of in, in the checkout lines. And I use those all the time just because I usually don't buy a lot of stuff right. at one time. And it's faster to get through there. Um, but I just, it, it, being a Christian and trying to live honestly and justly, it never occurred to me that people could probably pretty easily go through those lines and rip stuff off. Uh, I used to work security at Best Buy, and I would see that stuff all the time. People putting stuff in their knapsacks or... Uh, one thing they would love to do is buy a, a big old TV and then bring it back and cl claim something's wrong with it and try to get a refund. And what they did is they got free use of that TV over the Super Bowl weekend oh, or some, some yes. other thing like that, you know. Finally, the companies had to start cracking down on that because it, it, it became just a practice. You could count on the Monday after the Super Bowl for that week People are just bringing TVs back left and right uh, it, because they're just kind of renting a TV. Well, that's stealing from that company because now they can't sell that that TV. Right, as, as new in as box. New. They have yeah. to, to sell it as used if they can sell it as all, at all. And so you have deceived that, that company and kind of tried to get advantage for yourself and it, it's just a big lie. That's what happens. It, and as I said, it just became a, a practice. It, people joked about it. It, it was people, it, it was so widespread and accepted, but it's still deceit. That's right. And it just corrupts the society that does that and accepts it. Yep, that's right. And the standard has to be established and has to be defended or we're all in trouble no matter what you think or how much you think you're getting away with. I think that fits the, the child example I gave. You're going to buy a TV, take it home, install it, then put it back in the box, take it back, and think you got over. You had the money because you, you at least could swipe the credit card to do it. You pretend in front of your friends that you got a giant TV for your Super Bowl party, and then you take it back, and that's common practice. That's so stupid. Yeah. That makes me mad. Um, let, let me give you another one that I think is – Obviously, a form of deceit, but the word flattery, if you think about that for a minute, mm. Proverbs 20 and verse 19, he who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. It's the same thing, isn't it? That I would I would go to someone and say, man, you're awesome. Yeah. I, I can't think of a better person than you. I mean, you're one of the greatest people I know. I mean, you're smarter than everybody else. I mean, I've been watching you. At some point, the person getting all this praise has got to say, you dirty snake. Yeah. You are what up are you to doing? something. Yeah. Why do people flatter with their lips? Mm. Yeah, they're just trying to get advantage. They want something from you, and uh, they're baiting you. Right. There it it's is It's deceit. Again. There it is And again. they're, they're going to wait till you walk into it and spring the trap. And hopefully, like you just said, somebody hearing all this is going, who are you describing? You know, this is this butter is a little too thick for me to digest. That's right. You're up so to something. Something's going on here. Yeah. yeah. It, it just isn't good. No. You maybe you want to be seen by the world that you're in with that group or that person, so you just praise them, praise them, praise them. You turn into a yes man no matter what oh. is being talked about or said, and you you are devaluing your own self-worth and your own worth in the eyes of others in, in the process of doing that. Flattery is never a good thing. 
Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. That is a scary verse to me because it says a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it. So if I lie to you, and I'm, t- I'm saying it's for your sake, it's better that you not know this, and so I lie to you, the Bible says you hate that person. Yep. Because you won't tell them the truth. You won't tell them the truth. That's right. And you're giving them something that's dishonest and wrong to now reason with or to move forward on. So though I tell myself, no, I'm, you know, we're not going to tell Grandma what happened today because she won't handle it or whatever. Let's let's protect Grandma by lying to her in that case or in that scenario. The whole family has learned that we just don't really like Grandma that much. It's better to lie to her and to keep her in the dark on any given topic than to tell her the truth and deal with what may come from that. That's a that's a profound perspective that when you lie to somebody, whether it's for a supposedly noble or good motive or not, you're damaging them. You're damaging your relationship. Yep. You won't do that to someone that you love. Nope. So that puts it in pretty stark terms. Well, I don't hate my grandmother. Well, you're willing to deceive her. Your actions show that you yeah. do. But yeah. it's it's for her own good, is it really? <laughs> Lying is going to be for good. Like you said, let's be honest and deal with it. Uh, overcome this issue. Resolve it. And then everything will be stronger and better than it was before. What if Grandma finds out that you lied to her what is she going to do how is she going to feel will she feel loved yeah exactly no she will not and then the flattering mouth works ruin same thing Mm -hmm. it is designed to do damage and it's awful so these these are the pictures that we see I, i i got so many verses psalm 52 psalm 36 talks about the deceitful man, the way that he operates and works, and how he tears down his own house in the process uh, because he's a liar. And, and the truth can be tested. It can be examined. The, 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 the famous saying that we have is that the, tr- the truth does not fear examination. Right. And to me, that says it all. Deceit does fear examination because the person who's doing it knows it's not true, that there's, there's no integrity in it, and it will be found out. And I think too, the other side of that, that we can't forget about for ourselves and for those that we're dealing with, that someone who is deep in deceit will go to war with you about what they're saying is actually true. Yeah. They will fight you about that. They'll, until they'll the lie barren. about their lie. That's right. Yeah. And, and they will begin to demean you and make it look like you're the one who isn't right or hasn't mm-hmm. been practicing uh, in a faithful way. And, and so be ready for that. If you if you find yourself raising your voice in a conversation where you know you're wrong, shut it down. Stop going that direction. It won't turn out well. Even if you win that argument, everyone who leaves that room says, well, we know who they are. Yeah. Yep. Note to self. Yes. That person is not our friend. That person is not on our side. And though you won the argument, you know, and everyone agreed to go along with your insanity in that moment, you've lost the war which you should have been fighting for yourself to, to show that you're you're true yeah, to what you is right. You should be upholding your integrity and Such developing an that thing. trust in other people. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned you have a whole bunch of verses. Well, that just emphasizes what we mentioned before. God has a lot to say on this subject. Yeah. He's deeply concerned about it. And so I was attracted to Ephesians 4, verses 14 and 15, where Paul says that it's God's desire that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Oh, man. So that's how dangerous it is. What he wants from us is speaking the truth in love so that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Well done. There's the contrast. We can either trick men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting or we can speak the truth in love because we love yeah and that is that's what really is demonstrating love lies as we just saw do not demonstrate love no speaking the truth in love 
demonstrates love. In its purest form. That is such a great way to finish this. Wow. That's a great verse. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verses 14 and 15. 14 and 15. Strong message there. And again, there it is up into the New Testament. The the New Testament has a lot to say about deceitfulness too. That's right. God does not want this corruption uh, entering in among his people. Yep. Read it, learn it, live it. Uh, It is there for our good. Awesome. Well, you got anything else? Uh, Just some... Trivial things, I think. Trivia, sweet trivia. We have trivia questions for each other and for the whole world. We're going to ask four questions, and we hope you know the answer to them. Again, the, the purpose for this, part of the purpose is that whether you knew this or didn't, you can go look at it, look mm-hmm. it up and say, you know, again, that's, that's the measuring stick. Does the Bible say that? Is that really in the scriptures? <laughs> well, look at look it up. Yeah. Uh, learn that and apply it in your daily life. This is good for us in so many different ways. Um, Kurt is going to ask all of us question number one. If you're ready, Ooh, let me have it. Putting, sir, giving the ball to me. Yes, sir. Okay, here's the first one. When uh, when God was uh, leading up the people up to the the promised land in Canaan, how did He describe the fruitfulness of the land? That quick phrase that was used so mm-hmm. many times, uh, flowing with milk and honey. That's correct. Yep, Exodus three seventeen, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they brought back the evidence that showed that was true. <laughs> very a very fruitful and, and luscious land. Yeah, that is such a cool way to just say it all, yeah. right? It's flowing, flowing, with, milk flowing and with milk and honey. What a glorious place. Well, good. All right, so we got the first one right. Question number two. Um, Jesus is talking to his apostles about the Holy Spirit, and he says to them in in John 16, I'll give you the chapter. In John 16, he says that when the Helper, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of three things. What were the three things that the Holy Spirit was going to convict the world of? Oh, my. It's a hard question. Of righteousness, justice, and judgment to come. Uh, Righteousness and judgment are correct. There's okay. one other. He will convict the world of sin. Yes. Okay. Sin is the first one. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay. That's John 16, verses 8 through 11. Okay. I couldn't remember the exact quote, but you should have mercy on an old guy. <laughs> Danny, these specific uh, really? questions like that, you're, you're trying to get my memory to work, and it's not there anymore. <laughs> I told you it was hard. So I'm, I'm gonna, I am going to show mercy because the sermon is on this very topic ah, Sunday. Good. So I'm just going to pound it home. I can be reminded then. On Sunday. Excellent. Yes, <laughs> okay. All right, your second question for All us. All right. Um, after the flood, God put a rainbow in the cloud. What was that a token of? What did he say that was for? I believe the term used is it, it is his covenant uh, with the earth, the whole earth, but with man uh, to remind them, and, and it's a remembrance from him to us that he would never destroy the earth with water again. Right, that's correct. Good. Genesis chapter nine, verses thirteen through fifteen. He was promising there would no no more be a global flood. Has he kept that promise? Yep. We now we see local floods, right. so we know that that's not what that <laughs> promise is about. No, it's about a flood that destroyed the world. A global deluge. Yeah. But he will destroy the world again. Yes, he will. Not by water, Not but this no. time by fire. With fire, that's First right. First Peter 3. Every element will burn with a fervent heat. Yep. Awesome. That's a great question. Good job. Are you getting help? Because these are questions are getting better. No. This is all coming out of you, huh? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> you better not be deceitful in what I'm we're... not being deceitful. I'm, I'm not thinking up all these questions. Okay. Maybe your friend, the internet. is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question for the day. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, Paul tells Timothy that Demas has forsaken him. Why did Demas forsake Paul? Because he loved this present world. That's right. 2 Timothy 4.10, having loved this present world. Demas, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Very good. 2 Timothy 4.10. All right. Well, those were our questions. We did really well. I hope the audience did, too. Yeah. And I hope our audience is having fun with these. Me, too. Uh, But again, as you mentioned, the motivation is you'll learn these things by reading the scriptures. 
the reason we can get these answers is because we've read the Bible yeah. over and over and over. Yeah. And we've heard it discussed and talked about and preached. And you, that's how you gain this kind of knowledge. It's, these are trivial things, but these are things that happened in the scriptures that help us to be aware of. Absolutely. They, they, help, it, they help our lives when we're aware of them. How does God grant wisdom to men um, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and this is a good way to do it, you know, just to throw out those trivia questions and say, oh, I do know the answer to this. Or if I don't, I sure do know know where to find it because they just gave me a verse. Mm -hmm. So all that's very good. Uh, We hope this has been helpful to you today. And as we always do, it is our sincere prayer and hope that it's helpful to you. We've talked about deceit. Um, Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord. Uh, Use the measures and scales that are right, that are agreed upon, and know that what is done is done for the benefit of everyone. 